So what I want to do, first of all, is I want to set the scene for Julian of Norwich. The dates are a little bit indecisive. 1342, perhaps 1429, but most definitely uh, she sort of is living in 1413. So scholars sort of are definite on some things and marvelously indefinite on other things. And the time of death sort of seems to be one of those. I'm going to set the scene for her one text, which is the sum total of her fame. The scene is the scene of the plague and the, back, and the Black Death. And after sort of I talk about that particular scene, which I'm saying is implicated in her text, absolutely implicated in her text, I will talk about the text as two texts, a so-called long text written 20 years before, a short, rather short text written before a long text. And then I'm going to draw out of that uh, what I take to be sort of you know, her incredibly interesting uh, theology sort of of mercy, uh, but in the context of offering her age in a time of plague consolation. Setting the scene. Julian of Norwich is one of those remarkable medieval women mystics like Hildegard of Bingen, Heywitch of Antwerp, Marguerite Perret, Angela of Foligno, and Catherine of Siena, who were visionaries, poets, instructors in the mystical life, speaking of and enjoining a maximal Christianity that if characterized by suffering and trial, had as its exclusive aim intimacy with God, understood as an infinite reality, who has pledged to be in relationship with us as individuals, just as he has pledged to be with his church and communicate truths about himself and his relation to us to, through the fundamental vehicles of this church, his creeds, his doctrines, his sacraments, and his spiritual and moral instruction. These women do and do not constitute a type. Each is in a liminal space via via the ecclesiastical establishment. Inside it certainly, but not at its very center. And most right in the vernacular, whether German, Dutch, Italian, Old French, or in this case, Middle English. Yet their gifts are diverse. Some are visionaries, some are poets. Some pay close attention to the institution of the church. Others work very much to the side of it. Some focus on their experience of God. Others focus on their experience of God, or rather what it means for the Christian community at large in its fragmented and sinful state. Each in effect is a singularity with different but related agendas of reform of the church or the realization of a mode of Christianity, or rather that version of Christianity, both in its profoundest depths and its most glorious heights. Julian of Norwich holds her own in this very distinguished company and bequeaths a text called Showings or sometimes Trent translated as revelations, which if marked by her English medieval context is, and this is the beauty of the text, just sui generis. To say that it is marked by her context is to say that she inherits a particular form of Christian spirituality that is Christocentric, and specifically focused on the cross, and even more especially, on the humanity of Christ as mediating salvation. But her work is also marked by the Black Death, which, like COVID, is both international and national, having moved from the East to trade routes to arrive in Europe in 1348, traveling from South to North and decimating, decimating populations wherever it went. When the catastrophic outbreak of the bubonic plague occurs in Norwich, 
In 1348, Julian, not her real name, but the name of St. Julian's Church with which her hermitage is associated, is six years of age. The first outbreak of the plague on some estimates has a 50% mortality rate in Norwich, then England's second city. There are subsequent outbreaks also, a major one in 1361 that takes 10% of the population. And the further outbreaks again, about every 10 years or so, that remind the population of the catastrophe of 1348 and keep pressure not only on this acute sense of human mortality, but also bring to mind the various responses to this dreaded disease. The horror of, at the ugliness of the disease that reduces bodies to postules and pus, just the opposite of the good death. The recoil of family and friends from those who have it. The common trauma of mass burials and burning the numbing of sensibilities as individuals grope to accommodate and normalize the terrible. And of course, imagination run riot. Devils everywhere and the thirst for any explanation as to who brought us into this afflicted state. Ourselves, perhaps, or a particular group, maybe the Jews, who might serve as a scapegoat for an event and trial that has made us less than human reduced us, as Simone Weil might say, to the order of affliction, to the domain of necessity in which we come to experience that God does not seem to hear our prayers, or that we have found ourselves too withdrawn and sealed to be able to pray. Finally, of course, there is the question whether the abhorrent disease that makes us forget everything good and beautiful that we might have found in our life and that we might think fondly as we pass. All that we experience is we experience those who die and die in agony. And all that we see is their particular shame and our shame to come. The last vestiges of dignity removed. Is the plague God's judgment on our communities for infidelity or on our transgressions? just punishment for what we have done and what we have failed to do. A question asked, a perennial question, one that has occupied us in the modern period with all its calamities, all its wars, its genocides and ethnic cleansings, its tsunamis, and of course, its plagues. The bubonic plague is an event that is there at the very beginning of Julian's life and at its end and shadows everything in between. It makes her think of life not simply as marked by suffering, not otherwise specified, but by appalling suffering that is graphic and elemental is in its attack on the human body and reveals not only our precariousness, but also tends to lay bare our soul. Suffering is not merely physical. It tunnels inward to claim the soul of one who most certainly is about to die. If you have the disease, it's about two weeks. And cycles to the traumatized families who have long since said goodbye and have turned to contemplate their own appalling exit. Julian also seems to recognize the insidious way in which a disease breaks familial and community bonds, which normally provide the environment in which the dignity of each person, and therefore all, is sustained. This rather than caginess perhaps explains not only Julian's stated conviction that the showings or revelations are less God's gift to her than to the community, and her constant references throughout for the need for wholeness and integrity of this community that is essentially under siege. And I will give you sort of a brief resume sort of of the text. Despite what I've just said, 
Remarkably, throughout showings, there is not a single direct recall of the plague. Still, there is much in the text that suggests that the plague provides the script of a form of hyperbolic suffering of human beings that the text seems to suppose and that only becomes bearable when the measure of suffering is provided by the suffering of Christ. Similar to the plague-ravaged bodies of the citizens of Norwich and London and European cities everywhere, the body of Christ is graphically disfigured and both redolent and creative of an almost unbearable form of aloneness. Not all the 16 visions, and there are 16 visions, but the more visual of them focus on the bleeding and battered body of Christ, the crown of thorns and the tearing of and the hanging down of Christ's scalp. That's a detail you didn't particularly want. The discoloration of the face moving from a tinge of yellow to brown and blue ending in black. The scourging and the massive tears in the back. Christ's final agony and death, and post-mortem, his pierced heart. We are spared no detail. As in Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ, there is blood and gore everywhere. Again, despite the lack of historical reference, we get a sense of the medieval understanding of the interaction of the infernal with a normal order in Julian's sporadic references to devils, who, if they could be blamed for a disease, are also in the battle with angels for the souls of the afflicted at the hour of their death. Undoubtedly, the references to devils read more like an appeal to a convention that could or should be questioned than a principal conviction. That is, it's not the case that Julian is terribly preoccupied with these devils. Questioned by the text also is the hysterical coping strategy of medieval communities at laughing at devils, a coping strategy that Julian herself exhibits in her tete-a-tete -tete with Christ, for which she receives a reproof. The very coping strategy, this is what's wrong with it, suggests that so-called Christian believers have far more faith in devils than in God, and that this is the relationship that goes deepest, despite the church and this mediation of Christ's grace, and despite our convictions about the omnipotence and omniscience, as well as the goodness of God. There is much more in the text than the visions of the crucified Christ, and necessarily so. For the issue of the text is not the suffering itself, but rather the meaning of this suffering as it relates to our healing and our salvation. But first, there's an ambiguity. Do the visions suggest a call for repentance and or, or imitation? These are options routinely taking up in the medieval period. Or are the visions intended to provide consolations for Julian, and more particularly, the Christian community from which she never separates her charism. The answer cannot be read off the visions themselves, which it turns out are an answer if and only the right questions are asked. So showings or revelations is not simply a chronicle of 16 visions, not all of which are graphic in any event, but the visions interpreted and explicated and submitted to theological reflection over two distinct periods of Julian's life as an anchoress, marked a life marked by asceticism and prayer and the reading of scripture. The visions occurred in 1373. They are the subject of the so-called short text. 
despite a desire to let the vision speak more or less for themselves, they're not left uninterpreted, nor does the short text fail to suggest theological implications that might be at odds with church teaching. The second text produced 20 years later, that is, in 1393, the so-called long text, sticks faithfully to the original 16 visions, though the proportion of interpretation and theological explication relative to presentation of visions is significantly larger in a text that is approximately four times the size. It should not go unnoticed, or at least uncommented, that in explicating her visions of Christ, Julian pays attention to the gospel narratives and interpreting her visions evokes John and Paul, in the latter case especially Philippians, 1 Corinthians, and Romans. She also pays attention to church teaching on Christ and Christ's salvific and healing capacity. The nature, also, the nature and origin of sin, the reality, question, question mark, of hell, the nature of beatitude. Despite the manifest tension between some of her interpretations and or theological speculations and her teaching on many of the above matters, she willingly concedes to church authority and avoids the fate of someone like Marguerite Perret. In the short text, she insists that her views, based on what she saw, can ultimately be squared with the views of the church, if not necessarily in this life. Despite her continual avowal of submission to church authority, in the longer text, Julian seems more subjectively confident about the validity of her interpretations of the visions and the drawing out of the theological impl implications, though she continues to admit that neither is probative. Because of the radical nature of some of her views, especially but not, but not only her conjectures regarding universal salvation, the temptation exists to read showings as if it were a theological text um, by tying them to visions who, whose value will ultimately be decided by the church. Plausible as this theological interpretation is, that she's doing theology, might appear, it hardly does justice to a text in which the terms comfort, consolation, solace are everywhere, and where what the human situation demands is an alleviation of our suffering and a buttress against the despair that arises when we look at our sinfulness, indeed, when we cannot take our eyes off of it. The showings are essentially a book of consolation in line with Boethius' The Consolation of Philosophy. The consolation is intended to be affected by drawing out the implications of Christ's passion and death. One and perhaps the first most obvious implication is that of Christ's solidarity with our human suffering. That is, that we're not alone. Another implication is that the suffering of Christ is such that it exceeds and encompasses ours. It exceeds because though the suffering is associated with Christ's humanity, the fact that Christ is divine makes the suffering infinite in dimension as well as monumentally gratuitous. So it exceeds but it also envelops in that even though the suffering occurs at a particular moment in history, it is exemplary and cradles the suffering of all persons and communities throughout all time. There is a sense then in which, in a surprising way, Pascal's claim that Christ suffers with all of us until the end of history and to the end of the world is anticipated by Julian. In terms of function, 
an effect in terms of our reception of it. If Christ's solidarity with our suffering makes us feel less alone, the excess and exemplarity of the suffering consoles by downsizing our suffering. The suffering is further downsized by, Ju by Julian referring to the temporal span of our suffering compared to the life of bliss, honor, and delight that is promised and that awaits us. Our suffering is but a moment, a blink, a brief candle, mercifully snuffed out. The visions, the visual and the non-visual ones, which are also accompanied by imagined auditions of Christ speaking, are also intended to provide comfort for those distressed by sin and its eternal consequences. Mainly, of course, the fear of hell, but perhaps also a fear of purgatory understood as a place of punishment rather than purification, and the prospect of an almost endless but not quite everlasting state of existence that does not enjoy communion with God. The downsizing of sin, which accompanies the downsizing of suffering, happens along a number of different tracks. Julian exclaims in both the long and short text that in her visions, surprise, surprise, she did not see sin and leaves it to our readers thereby to determine the status of sin via via the appearance of a lordly but utterly benevolent Christ. She adds that to the degree to which creatures appeared in her vision, despite the distortions of sin, no one, absolutely no one, is corrupted all the way down. At their core, to change the metaphor, at bedrock, each person has a godly will. And this is supported and buttressed by the view of creation as a hazelnut, a homely characterization intended to suggest something about the loveliness, there's a lovely Middle English term, behoovely, the beautiful, behoovely, the loveliness as well as the fragile character of the order of creation that God does not simply bring into being, but lovingly brings into being. And I want to talk about Christ, character, disposition, and the nature of God. The main vistas of consolation of those who fear God's judgment and eternal, eternal and semi-permanent punishment across both the short and long texts are the depiction of Christ his character, his disposition towards us, and what we might call his theological status. I will treat each of those in, in turn. In terms of character, despite or because of his suffering, Christ is lordly. Undoubtedly, Christ's suffering is sacrificial. But, and this is crucial for her, Christ is glad to suffer on our behalf. There is nothing grunting or grinding about it as if Christ is the hero in the latest action movie defeating the best efforts of the torturer. In a paradoxical way, the suffering is easy for Christ, at least in the sense that if we knew Christ outside of his suffering, we would not be shocked that he endured this for us. For if we knew our God properly, this is precisely what we would expect God to do for us. In his untoward, that is gratuitous, but now we can understand that towards suffering on our behalf, Christ shows his, by medieval term, his honor. Even more importantly, in and through his suffering, Christ, who obviously doesn't need to do this, confers honor or we should say, worth on us. 
we have infinite worth, not that we own it, but it's conferred on us. The Lord who is at the center of Julian's visions is magnanimous because courteous. That's not a starting word for you. Admittedly, or confessedly, courteous seems a weak word for us moderns, and generally it tends to mean civility as defined by our current social conventions, which are the gravamen of books of etiquette, which arguably may surpass mismanners in depth, but perhaps not by much. Not so with Julian, who understands well that the term circulates with other terms in the medieval code of honor. And one extraordinary effect of the term is that it deflects attention away from focusing on honor being owed to God to honor being conferred to us. The most glorious, get at the root metaphor, the most shining, brilliant Lord, astonishing, astonishing in beauty, even in the passion, is characterized fundamentally by conferring honor on creatures, an honor that is not their own, that in short they neither possess naturally nor can plausibly earn. What's being suggested is that the visions gifted to Julian affect a recentering of Christian faith and imagination on the central message of the gospel, namely our redemption by Christ. Now, if redemption necessarily supposes sin and counters it, and that most certainly does, at the same time, it is so far, she thinks, in excess of it as everything is to nothing. For Julian, this asymmetry between sin and redemption, which finds expression in scripture, above all in Romans 5, has a number of implications, and two are particularly important. First in line with this asymmetry that attests to the secondness of sin, and at best is parasitic nature, she reminds that the notion of sin as, this is classical, the privation of good, and thus at bottom devoid of substance, Augustine can say as much, should not be used, and she fears it is being used, to reproduce the elevated consciousness of sin and a tormented conscience in which the goodness and mercy of God falls out of the Christian picture. Rather, she thinks, is not the basic insight that sin is not ultimately decisive ingredient in the correction of our imagination and the alleviation of our fear. And for Julian, if fear has any place in Christianity, and she thinks it has very little, it can only be the reverent fear of a glorious savior who is the object of our worship and gratitude. And second, in contradistinction to theological authorities such as Augustine and Anselm, Julian wonders whether sin is adequately cast as rebellion or whether we would move closer to the basic phenomenon of the sinner and sin by thinking of it as a form of blindness characterized by error in judgment whose secondary effect is losing confidence in God's mercy and is grounded in God's indefeasible goodness. Our view is hardly without support in scripture. It is shaped in a determinate way by the parable of the prodigal son. From the point of view of the parable, the easy forgiven, forgiving of the errant son by his loving father, who seems to know something the, prodigal brother, the prodigal's brother does not, is congruent with the view that while sin is not trivial, it is more in the order of dissipation than in the order of concentration in which, one, in which one might be, pre be prepared to say with Milton's Lucifer, evil be thou my good. Nor is it without precedent in the theological tradition. Irenaeus' view, way back in the second century, 
of the fragile, unsteady nature of human beings as embodied creatures who require a pedagogy in and through which we learn by our mistakes marks the approximate area in which the ponderings of Julian takes place and makes intelligible her sense that sin is permitted by God and turns out to yield a good, even if a difficultly require, acquired one involving the pain of repentance and the courage of perseverance. A feature of Julian's attempt to refocus our attention on Christ's suffering and courtesy is a reserve regarding judgment being deemed central to the character of Christ. In showings, there is no analog to the judgment scene in the city of God that favors the apocalyptic judgment scene of Matthew 25 and the intra-historical scenarios of judgment or division between those who belong to Christ and those who belong either to Satan or the Antichrist. The putting in parenthesis of this characterological trait, the judgmental one, also has a profound affection, rather effect, on the figuration of the drama of redemption as a struggle between the prerogatives of wrath, God's right, righteous anger, and divine mercy. Julian is more than usually declarative for a medieval mystic given to declaratives. Wrath has no prerogatives whatsoever, since it really has no place in God. Julian's relatively comprehensive set of visions, she, she suggests, no more reveals wrath than hell, or at least the hell that is populated. In addition, even when she looks for it or inquires as to whether it might be implied in her vision, she comes up empty. Wrath is not a phenomenon in God. Wrath, anger, furious anger, is purely a human phenomenon and is born of ignorance and stubbornness and fueled by our shame and our self-loathing. In any event, for Julian, Wrath has an unfortunate hold on our imagination. Too often it is the lens in and through which we read our current reality. And if not that, then our future destiny. To imagine thus, she thinks, is neither to feel or to think Christianly. It convicts us of a lack of faith. It provides the basis of a major theological faux pas. That is, that divine mercy is fundamentally constrained and thus in the end determined by wrath, enjoying its proper remittance. Julian does not explicitly challenge this view either on theological grounds, that is, that does not match up with the best in the theological tradition, or philosophically, that this view of God's wrath raises the specter that God's mercy is finite rather than infinite. In a very real sense, Julian's natural province as a human being is that of pictures, whether real or religious pictures. The visuals of her visions are the quasi-visuals quasi that constellate around the core visions of Christ crucified. And then, as she interprets, her interpretive figuration and refiguration. Relative to our a, her age, of crisis and escalation of sin consciousness, she paints Christ. And her visions really are like paintings and may be actually influenced by paintings. She points to Christ and thus the God revealed in Christ. She points otherwise. And relative to the theological tradition, she wishes to disambiguate the theological picture in which if the mercy of Christ was rarely ignored. Nonetheless, it tended to function against the background of divine wrath, whether wrath was associated with the Father alone or whether Christ was effectively implicated. It would be a mistake to think that Julian has no interest in aligning herself with the theological tradition more broadly and not simply for reasons of prudence. There can be no doubt that Julian skillfully negotiates between the claims of authority of our own visions and the authority of the church as institution and its theological, largely Augustinian tradition. While that might smack of contrivance to some, connivance to others, 
Nevertheless, there is an undoubted sincerity in her painting of Christ. At, one, at once a gift of a complete picture, and on the other, a more or less empty canvas in which one finds the faint lines of an incomplete sketch accompanied by the imperative to draw and color in, that is, to interpret and to theologically speculate. She can and does, even if fleetingly, call on the patristic motif of Christ's descent into hell and his victory over sin and death. As the, as the descent points to solidarity with the lost as a crowning action of Christ's mission, it also is the epitome of who he is. Boundless compassion and mercy that is not the contrary of divine power, but its definitive expression. Needless to say, in God, no less than in human being, character and disposition are intrinsic, intrinsically related and can only be artificially separated from each other. Nonetheless, focusing on the disposition of Christ as a set of behaviors he exhibits towards us brings out particular aspects of his character that throw light simultaneously on his relationship to Mary as well as our relationship to both. We have already captured some elements of the disposition when we spoke to Christ's solidarity with our suffering. Now more specifically, we can speak to his sympathy for the suffering of our broken and disfigured bodies that make us feel like the wretched of the earth, utterly alone, not only without comfort, but also without hope. Christ and also the spirit of Christ is the comforter. He shelters, protects, supports, abides, accompanies. Moreover, he is the one who calms our fears regarding our salvation, both by reminding of his constant presence and assuaging the imagination that will have us as one of the denizens of hell. Assuaging the imagination, which more than dogma rivets our attention, is one of the main tasks of showing as a text of consolation in a time marked by acute suffering and a crossover to the elevation of sin consciousness, which is bereft of the sense of the transfigur transfiguring power or grace. What Julian is trying to show is that there is no truth or faith that is not inflected by Christ. Though obviously Christ, who has been properly figured as creator and redeemer, and not as judge. To judge what something is worth before a tribunal is not a heavenly way of judging. The only judgment, judging done by God is his valuing his creatures far more than they value themselves, granting them worth that human beings routinely find inexplicable. Finally, even as early as the short text, the disposition of Christ toward the suffering humanity is analogous to that of Mary, since essentially her tenderness and solicitude towards the suffering and degraded humanity mirrors his. The ordering of mirroring is crucial for the text. Julian would not tolerate the disjunction of the stern Christ on the one hand and the merciful mother of God on the other hand who intercedes on our behalf, as if, to, as if to cajole the fire of mercy out of hard flint. If Mary is the mother of God, she is the human exemplar of her son's divine kindness. She participates in divine mercy and demonstrates how available it is to all humanity by pointing away from herself towards her son, who is both her child and her creator. And third and finally, from character and disposition, both of which are expressed in saving action, Julian moves to contemplate the nature of God in which both texts, she makes clear, is defined by love and exclusively so. Moreover, this love is the love of the Trinity. Julian is an astonishingly Trinitarian theologian, and one can only speculate as to what she had read. Nonetheless, it is clear that she that she has a clear, clear grasp of the doctrine of the Trinity and may well have been familiar with its use in medieval mystical theology 
for union with God, union with the Trinity, to find the purpose of the pilgrimage of life, and where the momentary status of union or intimacy with God in this life was a foretaste of the heavenly state where union with the triune God was permanent and permanently enjoyed and everlastingly fruitful. That God is love is in one sense an object of her direct vision. Both in the third and the sixteenth vision have this in view, even if there is a sense in which we are talking about vision in an inverted comma sense, and perhaps something more nearly like an intellectual intuition. In another sense, that God is defined by love is something like a logical implication of Julian's interpretation of Christ's passion, which is ordered towards our rescue from suffering and sin, and the fulfillment that derives from union with God, who inexplicably loves us utterly and wants us to be in communion with him. Love is generative of a form of seeing that pierces through the ugliness of suffering and the disfiguration of sin that mark our earthly lives. The God who loves us is, of course, seeking a responsive love from us. It may seem that when we search for God, and we don't often, that the initiative comes from us. Julian suggests in a pattern that would do justice to Augustine, Aquinas, or Dante, suggests that our seeking of God is a response to God's seeking of us. Thus with prayer, we will never have begun to pray to God. And prayer is our dialogue and communion with God. Unless God has been the agent with respect to our seeking. Similarly, with faith defined as trust in God, God will have trusted us first. And despite or because of his omniscience, will have stood by us. Our trust reflects his steadfastness. Reflection on God's love, any steadfastness, are meant to console. They're also intended to encourage a responsive love and a responsive faith. As a text of consolation, however, the crux has to do with hope. Of course, the renewal of faith and the conviction of God's love enables, enables and fosters hope. Perhaps even more, there is at least an outline in showings that the theological virtue of hope is grounded in God after the manner sort of, of, of love and faith. That is, that our hope in the passingness and meaning of suffering and in eternal life is grounded in God's hope for us individual Christians, the church, and perhaps ultimately the human race. The force of God's hope is that it gives us a future beyond, even if through our suffering, gives life where there is death, consolation where there is desolation, communion where there is isolation, and gives permanence to joy by fixing it on the only reality that deserves it, the only object capable of continually renewing it. And now I come to a conclusion. Just a concluding reflection to bring this medieval text to us now. What are we to make of this incredible text written in the 1300s, lost, rediscovered in the 1600s, uh, and kind of translated uh, into modern English uh, in sort of the 20th century. What are we to make of this text that is at once the discovery of God in dire times, in a time of plague, and God's inexplicable romance with us, in which forgiveness of our sins is, is such as to be more or less automatic as hardly to look like forgiveness at all. In any event, forgiveness does not seem to be a strenuous activity for God. 
It is the air God breathes, or should we say the Holy Spirit? It certainly speaks to us in our dire, in our dire, dire time in which, to quote Shakespeare, the withers have been unwrung. That is, everything has come unraveled. It also, I take it, manages to unrubbish Christianity of the fear-mongering that has accompanied it almost from the beginning and, read the dis and rediscover the gospel, which is a text of extraordinary consolation. Even if so that we have to rediscover it in and through the detour of visions and the interpretation of those visions. Yet, of course, it has to be said, the text is incredibly theologically risky. Promoting theological views that are rejected by the Catholic Church, for instance, universal salvation, and correlatively the unreality of hell. And perhaps a little unbalanced, not so much in suggesting that sin, for the most part, can be characterized by blindness and bad judgment. This view, after all, is foundational in the philosophical tradition that Christians negotiate but rather in suggesting that it is always such and that human beings never rise to malice. A scan of history and attention to our world would likely vouchsafe evidence of neglect, carelessness, and general sleepwalking. That would make, it bl make us blind. But also we are likely to find instances of, cal of callousness and malice that cry to the heavens for justice. So perhaps in the end, Julian is right in the need for correction. But perhaps, as often happens sort of in theology, a correction can sometimes be an overcorrection. Yet, because her book is a book of consolation, we have to entertain the prospect that we have misinterpreted her because we have misinterpreted the genre. It's not straight up reflecting sort of on theological data or loci. Because of the often declarative form of her sentences, we may have not noticed their performative force, what they're supposed to do rather than what they seem to say. Everything she says has the purpose of consoling us for making us abide with more patience with our suffering and have love salve to heal the despair that results from our weakness, our veniality, and our self-love. That is, we might ask the question whether she trades in hyperboles and escalates the hyperboles. So in case you're not consoled, I will give you something more that might console you. And if that does not console you, I will say something sort of more again. Julian reminds us of something important we had forgotten while weaning us from ways of thinking about God and God's relation to us that distort the gospel message. She speaks to us in our time of plague where we can tend to cave in on ourselves and where the community can tend to fracture. We desperately need her voice. But we need also other Christian voices. Perhaps we're dealing with other plagues the cold carelessness or the circulation of money flying high above responsibility to the poor who are God's poor, the howling noise of our contemporary culture that has become the opposite of logos or reason, a word, divine word. That is, all rage, real and manufactured. And in any event, rage weaponized on social media platforms to inflict maximum damage and like the play, contagious and self-renewing and the default of demonization for those who disagree with us on matters trivial and important, arcane and obvious, who, but who also might look different than us, have a different belief system and a different form of life. Without injecting a God of justice into the conversation so that it becomes one more way to fuel the plague of our disunion and balkanization, nonetheless, perhaps a prayerful appeal to the God of justice as well as the God of mercy is in order. Perhaps also a theological anthropology understood to correct the corrector Julian because the theological anthropology that itself is prepared to exaggerate 
to give hyperboles, this time obviously dark hyperboles, and is prepared to escalate them. Sometimes human beings go darker than we think possible. What has started out as sleepwalking sometimes turns to malice and destruction. One world, different plagues, rhetorics and performances of consolation, rhetorics and performances of diagnosing the extent to which we have fallen as individuals and community, and the prophetic announcement of a God who is the God of justice, while, of course, also the God of surpassing mercy. Thank you.